Oh, that's weird. It didn't say recording in progress. It showed up here. So okay, good. Maybe it's muted in here. Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to Ocular Pathology Rounds on this Wednesday, October 4th, 2023. I will go ahead and get started. Maybe. Okay. Oh, it's still blocked. Okay. Great. Okay, the first case is a 13-year-old Silky Terrier. We got the right eye. The history is sad and includes um, history of phaco um, emulsification, so cataract surgery in April. Um, and then in May was diagnosed with coccidiomycosis uh, with retinal lesions and blindness. Uh, this eye also has glaucoma. Uh, there is anterior synechia, the globe is, the eye is avisual. There is a superficial corneal ulcer and they recommended a nucleation. The other eye also has history of cataract surgery and retinal folding with retinal slash subretinal dark opacification. And I thought maybe that was a granuloma um, and suspected valley fever lesions. So the right eye, the one with glaucoma was nucleated and submitted for histopath. So we don't have any more details about how they diagnosed uh, coccidiomycosis, but um, it was the clinical diagnosis. So here's the globe. Um, the cornea is up at the top and it is fairly opaque. Um, oh gosh, okay. Um, so uh, there is white material in the anterior chamber with a little bit of hemorrhage. So we have some hypopion, it's probably fibrinosuppurative exudate and a little bit of hemorrhage. The iris leaflets are actually attached to the lens capsule and they are bowed forward. So what we're seeing right here is the posterior chamber and over here. So there's very nice posterior synechia with iris bombay uh, that's visible in this gross picture. The lens capsule is outlined right here at least. And there was no intraocular lens present. So they did not replace the lens. They just left the empty capsular um, lens capsule. Um, and then there's this really complex network of stuff in the vitreal space. Um, the retina is probably detached. Um, the other possibility with the gross photo here is that the retina is still attached and very, very atrophied because we're seeing these um, sort of off-white lines of the choroid, which is the choroidal vascul vasculature, excuse me. Um, there's also quite a bit of hemorrhage in the posterior segment. And as I said, this sort of network of material throughout the vitreal space. So with that, let's go to the actual slide. All right. All right, so here is the globe. I'm just gonna put our little hand in the center there. Stay. All right, so over here we have the cornea. Um, there's that pink material in the anterior chamber, which corresponds to the white material that we saw in the gross photo. Um, once again, we have really beautiful iris bombay where the iris is very thin and bowed forward, and then its little pupillary margins are attached to the lens capsule. Um, so that's Iris Bombay, textbook. Um, the lens capsule is discontinuous anteriorly, actually multifocally, which I'll show you when we go to higher mag. And then the details of the posterior lens capsule are kind of lost, so we don't see them very well. And then there's quite a bit of hemorrhage in the posterior segment, as, as we saw in the gross photo. And there is this interesting network of membranes that sort of mingles with the hemorrhage. And then as we move back, this is actually a deeper section. So we don't have the optic nerve head in this sample, uh, in this section rather, the uh, retina is diffusely detached. So here is a short segment of it. And this is our extra slice that we call our gonio slice that also displays that really nice iris bombay and part of the lens capsule right there. So let's go ahead to higher mag. Take a peek at what we have. So 
So starting up front in the cornea, you can see the corneal epithelium is right here. It's a little bit hyperplastic and keratinized, and then it kind of tapers down and then it's absent. So this is that broad corneal ulcer that they mentioned clinically. Um, the peripheral corneal stroma is also vascularized. That's what this sort of band of basophilic uh, stuff is there. Um, when we move into the anterior chamber, there is this pink material. And as we go higher mag on the pink material, it is pink stuff with a bunch of, um, of these acicular clefts, which are where cholesterol crystals in, uh, were present before processing. And then we also have these scattered, much larger cells uh, with vacuolated cytoplasm, which are macrophages. So there's some macrophages in the anterior chamber kind of uh, munching away at some of this material. As we move back into the eye, the irritable corneal angle is collapsed, so we can't really say much about it other than it is collapsed, and that helps to explain the glaucoma, as does the bra or the 360 degree posterior sneakia of the iris to the lens capsule um, in that iris bombay. So here is um, the anterior lens capsule, and you can see it is discontinuous here, and there's also a fragment here. Oops, so it is multifocally discontinuous. Um, and for cataract surgery, that's where they make their incision to, to suck out the uh, abnormal lens material. And as we move posteriorly, here is um, the posterior lens capsules, and it is also discontinuous right here. So normally when they do cataract surgery, they, they hope to leave the posterior lens capsule intact. And then when they are successful at that and, and it is intact and they leave it intact and also that it has not ruptured prior to surgery, they usually will implant a fake lens, um, which these days, most more often than not, as far as my understanding goes, they're a soft foldable lens. So they, um, it's sort of made out of silicone hydrogel or something. I don't actually know what it's made out of, but um, they insert it into that lens capsule and then it helps the dog to actually focus on things the way it would for a human being as well in the normal lens. Uh, but anyway, there was no IOL in this case, probably because the posterior lens capsule was discontinuous. Um, and then, as I said, there were this really interesting network of uh, membranes that were present or that were visible at lower mag. And then as we look closer at them, they're formed of these vacuolated low cuboidal epithelial cells um, that look very similar to what is still present inside the lens capsule right here. And you can actually see that they are continuous with this membrane. This is a, an area where the membrane itself is thicker. Um, and it also, the membrane also has a bit of pink material with it, this fibrillar eosinophilic material, which is basement membrane material, or at least I thought it was basement membrane material. Um, so there's quite this network. It does extend out into the vitreal space where it kind of mingles with the hemorrhage. Um, oh, let's get into bit of focus. There we go. Um, there are there is some lens material remaining inside the lens capsule, and then in the more superficial section, which I won't show, there was actually a raft of lens material back here mingling with the vitreal hemorrhage, which is also not ideal. Um, but anyway, so here's the retina. It is diffusely detached and it is very atrophied because it is lacking the normal retinal layers. So diffuse detachment and atrophy. And then, oops. So that is about the gist of what we can see in this, um, in these sections. So, uh, what we have in this globe is it's post cataract surgery eye uh, with no IOL uh, and there's posterior lens capsule rupture and we have this proliferation of low cuboidal cells that look very similar to what's uh, lining the inside of the lens capsule. Um, I did not see any coccidioides organisms, um, which does not mean that it was not involved in the lesions of this eye. Um, period. So. Uh, in order to examine these membranes a little bit more closely, um, I ordered a PAS stain, which will highlight the basement membranes of the eye. And it turned out very well. Please. 
and confirmed what I thought was going on. Um, so when we look back here, so PAS is this color, per, per iotic acid shift, stains basement membranes bright pink like this, and the lens capsule is a basement membrane. Um, and then when we look higher mag, we see these cuboidal or these low cuboidal cells that are elaborating similar, although thinner, much more fibrillar uh, PAS positive material. And right in here, this unique network of it, it's sort of an astomosing trabeculae of this material is characteristic of lens epithelial cells that have undergone, well, that are um, basically hyperplastic and elaborating more lens capsule. And as we followed around, I won't do it, hi Mag, um, all of those low cuboidal cells in this membrane that are snaking, these membranes that are snaking throughout the posterior segment um, have this basement membrane material with them. So these are presumed lens epithelial cells that have grown out of the lens capsule and are elaborating more basement membrane, uh, i.e. lens capsule, because that's their job. Um, interestingly, there is a uh, similar material on the front of the iris. So you can see it right here. So here's that anterior lens capsule and that material with that base membrane, membrane in those cells is coming out and, and lining the anterior lens capsule. So um, this there are two possibilities for this material here. One is that this is also lens epithelium that is extending out of the lens capsule onto the iris surface. And another possibility is that this could actually be corneal endothelium that is extending onto the iris surface and also elaborating basement membrane. So the corneal endothelium is responsible for elaborating decimase membrane, which lines the back of the cornea. Um, I suspect these are all lens epithelial cells though. So that, those are the, mo the main uh, features of this eye histologically speaking. So let's go back to the PowerPoint and my extensive list of diagnoses, which I actually pared down a bit. So this patient was unfortunate in that it got cataract surgery in both eyes in April and then was diagnosed with coccidioides in May. Um, um, so the main diagnoses that I came up with were marked chronic intraocular hemorrhage with intraocular fibrosis. Um, there were some areas of fibrosis throughout. Um, so this is consistent with a spent fungal infection, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in the moment. And then this extensive network of low cuboidal, the spindle cells in the vitreous uh, with basement membrane material, um, which I believe are is extralenticular extension of lens epithelial cells. Um, another possibility was reactive iridociliary epithelium, but they don't typically elaborate the basement membranes. And actually, when I wrote the report with these diagnoses, I didn't have the PAS stain yet. Um, at any rate, so um, I personally feel that if we were not given the history of the coccidioides diagnosis, uh, post-cataract surgery gone awry could explain everything that we saw in this eye. So the chronic intraocular hemorrhage and all the membrane and synechia formation. Um, with the history of coccidioides, um, which the dog was presumably treated for, um, we could also interpret the chronic intraocular hemorrhage and retinal detachment um, as a spent fungal infection. Spent just refers to a treated um, intraocular fungal infection. So typically these dogs are diagnosed with a fungal infection and then uh, treated systemically with antifungals. And then often the, the lesions that we end up are the chronic intraocular hemorrhage with fibrovascular membrane formation and retinal detachment. So this is, I think this globe is sort of a gamish of the two possibilities here. And uh, we may never actually know the difference um, or what, what was more responsible for the lesions that we saw. So there we go. All right, any questions about that one? All right, next up is uh, an eight-year-old Yorkshire Terrier. Um, the history we got was severe episcleral injection, moderate blepharospasm, moderate diffuse corneal edema with posterior synechia and cataract formation, limited visualization of the interactive structures due to the corneal edema. Um, there was no known history of trauma. However, the patient was groomed the same day as the initial onset of clinical signs. Um, so everyone's a little bit worried that something may have happened at the groomer. Um, and then it, apparently it looks like the eye was enucleated about five days after the onset of clinical signs from what I can tell with the history. So here is the eye as we received it after it was hemisected. And what we have, the cornea is at the top here. 
Um, it is a little bit uh, cloudy, so there's that corneal edema they discussed uh, clinically. The anterior chamber contains some off-white, somewhat semi-solid material. We didn't sample the pupil very well. Um, this structure here is the lens, so it's hard to tell whether there's a cataract or not, um, but we can check that out a little bit closer uh, in the microscopic section. And then the posterior chamber and the vitreal space and the subretinal space all contain this flocculent off-white material, which is consistent with exudate, which at least probably has a bunch of neutrophils in it. The retina is presumably detached. Um, it kind of looks like maybe this is the retina. The optic nerve head is deeper in um, this uh, piece of tissue. And so here's the optic nerve. So basically at this point, we would say there's a separative endophthalmitis of this eye. And I think we did interpret it. Uh, yeah, anyway, okay. So there we go. So let's go back to our slide viewer. Okay, so um, I did deeper sections on this one as well to find what I was looking for, which I eventually did find. Um, but to get there, I'll take you on the path that took me there. So um, here is the eye. Let's do it in a second. So the cornea itself is actually pretty boring. I think uh, there's a little bit of peripheral corneal stromal vascularization. Um, there is this pink material in the anterior chamber, similar to the last case, uh, with a little bit of hemorrhage uh, present right here. Uh, it looks like there's also posterior sneaky in this case. So the, the pupillary margin of the iris is adhered to the lens. I think this space here is an artifact. And then when we move into the eye, um, there's a lot of purple stuff here and here and some eosinophilic fibrillar stuff around that as well. And then that purple stuff kind of extends back to line the retina. Oh, okay, so I was wrong. The retina is not that detached, I don't think, uh, in the gross photo. Anyway, because there's this space with not a whole lot in it. Anyway, um, and so the, as I said, this is a deeper section because um, the optic nerve head was sampled in the more superficial section. And then once again, here is the gonio slice, uh, which is showing more of more of the same stuff. back up to the cornea. So there's that peripheral corneal stromal vascularization again, which is really common whenever there's any kind of problem inside the eye. Um, here is that material that's in the anterior chamber. So this is a nice, all of this, this network of fibrillar material is uh, fibrin. And then as you can see, there are a scattered or small number of red blood cells admixed with the fibrin. There is a beautiful pre irritable fibrovascular membrane on the front of the iris. And uh, we can imagine that's what was causing the posterior synechia. And then when we, when we move back, um, all of that purple stuff corresponds to an ocean of mostly degenerate neutrophils. So this is pus. Um, there are scattered red blood cells around, and then here and there you'll also find a few macrophages, but really the, the majority of what we're seeing here are neutrophils. Um, as we move back, the lens capsule is discontinuous posteriorly. So here it is, it's a little curly cue. Um, and when it curls like this, we usually assume that means that it was ruptured prior to fixation. So in other words, I or whoever cut this eye did not cause this rupture of the posterior lens capsule. Um, and, but there's actually not a whole lot of lens pathology or lens lesions, I should say, um, to, um, suggest that it was longstanding. So maybe this occurred like at the time of surgery or something. It's a little hard to say. Um, there's a different form of purple stuff in this eye, which I will show you right now. So this, even from Lomag, um, so here are some neutrophils and this stuff is a little bit different looking than the neutrophils. And as we go higher and higher mag, um, it will resolve into uh, a whole ton of bacteria. Oh, that's the oh, they have the 100x. Okay. Anyway, we can't go any higher than this. But anyway, these are all bacterial colonies. Um, they are probably, I think they were all cocci, or at least that was the most uh, common 
uh, morphology that we had here. So there's just a ton of bacteria in this eye. So uh, at this point, um, when I got the initial slide, whenever you have this much bacteria in the eye, it is consistent with a contaminated penetrating injury. Um, we saw no, for, no sign of a corneal perforation, which is one of the more common ways that bacteria get into the eye through a corneal rupture. Um, we also did not find any um, perforation sites anywhere else in the eye. So um, in this case, we would assume that perforation site is very small. Um, the other thing that we that I found histologically is that the inflammation actually extended out into the tissue around the optic nerve. Um, so out here, we're in the um, sort of orbital um, fat. So the clear spaces are adipocytes. And you can see that there are a bunch of neutrophils out here, maybe some macrophages, and the plump cells could be fibroblasts or some sort. Um, so there's some orbital inflammation as well in this eye. So as I said, I went deeper because I was looking for something in particular, and I got really lucky because it is here in the gonio slice. And as we look here, there's something brownish right there, just barely sampled in that gonio slice. And as we go higher mag, you can see that it has like this really interesting sort of structure to it. And it's kind of refractile. and kind of brownish. So this is plant material. Um, and so this um, explains the presence of bacteria in the eye, um, even though I was never able to find an actual site of penetration of the sclera. Um, I wonder if it came up from kind of the posterior aspect. Uh, but anyway, so we assume that this is a migrating grass on that has unfortunately migrated uh, through the orbital space into and right through the sclera and then is now occupying the um, the inside of the eye. And it probably brought with it a whole bunch of bacteria and that are now proliferating happily in the eye as well. Um, we often consider grass ons in dogs as coming from the oral cavity. So they're running through the grass with their lips flapping in the breeze and they get some grass seed up inside their uh, lips. And then they unfortunately, because they're barbs, they will penetrate the oral mucosa and then migrate through the tissues. They can actually penetrate anywhere in the dog uh, or cat. Um, I think it's more common in dogs and uh, they can work their way through any, pretty much any internal organ. Uh, most of the plant intraocular foreign bodies that we get come from the Western part of the United States, definitely with the most coming from California. So I think they just have really vicious grass ons in California. Um, this dog was from Utah. Um, uh, but anyway, so whenever we see an eye that has really separative inflammation, particularly if there's bacteria, and we don't really see any kind of site of penetration of some larger object like an animal tooth, i.e. in a dog fight or cat claw injury or something like that, then we are a little bit sp suspicious of grass ons. And if we're really lucky, we get to sample them like this case. So sad for the dog, but at least we have an answer. And I uh, believe the grooming was a red herring. So it was not the, the groomer's fault. Um, so this is the basic uh, diagnosis here. So a severe fibrinoseparative and hemorrhagic endophthalmitis with abundant intraocular bacteria and intravitreal plant material, which was a presumed grass on. So that is all I have to present today. Next up is Megan, I believe. Dangerous way. Yeah. <laughs> I can exit the dangerous way. I can absolutely just see myself tripping over all the cores and keeping them all out. <laughs> all right. Um, for the next case, we have a representative gross photo because we didn't have a gross photo of the specific case in question, um, but it was too good of a case to skip over. So uh, we have a one year, 11 month old neutered male domestic short haired cat. Um, they say that this is an indoor outdoor cat. Um, this cat uh, was away from home outdoors for 1.5 days uh, and came back with a bad eye. Um, they say marked periocular cellulitis, plus or minus abscess, plus scleral perforation. 
Um, they said there was a lateral scleral perforation identified intraoperatively and iatrogenic, they say, posterior scleral perforation. Um, and then also the cornea was diffusely covered by a fibrinous plaque uh, like crusted tissue. That's how they describe it. Bad cornea as well. Um, so the cornea may not be as good for this representative gross photo, but uh, this may have been something like what our case would have looked like grossly. Um, you can see that the eye is full of blood, the lens is subluxated. Um, and one thing I'll point out is that in this case, um, it's a little bit worse in, in some ways, I think, than our case, but um, you can actually see the outline of the iris here, or one iris leaflet. Um, and it's sort of uh, way down here, whereas the limbus is way up here. So uh, it's been markedly displaced. Um, and then there's also this giant hole in the sclera back here in the posterior sclera near the optic nerve. Um, so uh, we'll switch to the histology. There we go. Um, so we didn't manage to find the uh, lateral site of perforation that they had seen intraoperatively, but we have plenty here to discuss regardless. Um, from a subgross view, you can see the uh, cornea is looking a little bit funny. There's some uh, purple at the edges of a very pink uh, area, and we'll look closer at that. Um, there's lots of hemorrhage and fibrin inside this eye. Not as bad as our representative gross image, but the iris leaflet is way down here, um, the base of the iris, and the limbus is way up here. So there's some displacement of the anterior uveal tissue. And in the back, we have this giant hole, which is probably what they um, were thinking might be iatrogenic. And grossly, we thought it might be iatrogenic too. But we'll take a closer look in a moment. Um, we'll talk about that. All right. There are some things that are easier to see on a not subgross. I'm going to put it the same way around that we had it on the subgross. Here we go. So starting from the front uh, with the cornea and going back, um, we have that area of really dark purple at the edges of a very light eosinophilic area. And in particular, uh, at the edge of the cornea on this side, um, we have this sort of wedge-shaped defect in the peripheral cornea slash limbus. And looking closer at that, there isn't actually much tissue in the midst of this defect. Um, and the edges of the collagen here and here are pretty sharply discontinuous. Um, the gap is filled maybe with a little bit of fibrovascular tissue and with separative exudates and blood. Um, so uh, this was potentially a site of laceration. Um, so sort of sharp transection of the fibers. Uh, and then moving into this uh, cornea, you can see that the surface is broadly ulcerated. There's no epithelium left here. Um, and the neutrophils are sort of suspiciously lined up along the edge of this pinker area of cornea, but don't really seem to extend past a certain point. Um, and that's usually quite suggestive of desiccation and or necrosis of the corneal stroma. It's kind of harder for the neutrophils to squeeze their way in there. And indeed, that's what's going on. Um, looking at this stroma too, it's rather posse cellular. So um, even for a corneal stroma, it's fairly low cellularity. We should have regularly interspersed clear nuclei of keratocytes in there under normal conditions. Um, and we we kind of do, but it's, it's low cellularity. And then we do have some purple stuff coming into here, which you might think could be the nuclei of keratocytes. Um, however, if we look closer at these little purple guys distributed, here and there in the midst of this cellular corneal stroma. They turn out not to be cryocyte nuclei at all. Maybe some of them are, um, but most of them are fungal hyphae. Um, we can get some um, really nice examples of those in here. Um, so basically there's a broadly ulcerated and extensively necrotic central cornea and in this necrotic cornea, which because it's a sharply demarcated area of corneal necrosis, we can call it a corneal sequestrum. Um, inside that corneal sequestrum, there is uh, colonization by fungal hyphae. Um, there is potentially also... Oh, I have resonated because that okay. was more... Then we have a bunch right on the surface. Yeah, here's, here's a good area too. Yeah, there. Better examples of fungal hyphae. Yeah, for. I, just asking because I knew they looked better and I can see someone out there looking like, oh, they don't look like fungus. Mm -hmm. That is. Yeah, there you go some good examples. Uh, there were also some bacteria uh, colonizing that uh, corneal sequestrum, uh, but the fungal fungus was the most interesting. So moving on, 
Well, um, we better focus off some enemies. So yes, sure. Showing. There you go. Looking better. Okay. Um, Especially on the lower medications. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the iris space is down here. Um, we have a ciliary body plica kind of coming off right next to it. There's still something of uh, the structure of the ciliary cleft, but they're rather disrupted and replaced by fibrovascular tissue and loss of blood and fibrin. Um, so this is actually cyclodialysis or uh, tearing of that anterior uvea away from its normal anatomic location. The iris space probably would have been roughly up here where decimase membrane ends and now it's way down here. So cyclodialysis, dialysis just means separation. Um, so separation of the ciliary body um, and or iris from its usual position. Um, this is something that happens with trauma. And let's head back to the giant hole in the back of the eye. Um, so the edge here, you could interpret as maybe iatrogenic because it's such a sharply discontinuous uh, edge and there's not much tissue reaction there. However, um, here by the optic nerve, it looks like it's actually an in vivo rupture of uh, the globe in the posterior uh, area back here. Um, so we have uh, a um, discontinuous edge of the sclera, and then sort of rounding that edge, there's hemorrhage and fibrin. And if you look closer what that purple is, it's reactive fibroblasts, um, fibrovascular tissue, sort of some degree of tissue reorganization in that area. Um, so this was a real in vivo site of rupture in this kitty uh, in the posterior globe. And then uh, in addition, you might be wondering where the heck the retina even is. And there are some areas of the retina that are visible at the edges at least. Um, and we have a rounded edge uh, end of the peripheral retina over here, which implies a real in vivo tear of that retina. And then if you're doubting whether this actually is retina, um, it is. <laughs> Barely. Um, so we have some naked blood vessels here. We have some rather sad and pycnotic looking uh, photoreceptor nuclei. Um, we can barely make out the layers of the retina here. So this is uh, what's left of retina, um, but it's detached, it's torn, it's extensively necrotic, and it's basically fragmented. Um, with trauma, sometimes there can be almost like a whiplash effect through the retina, um, and you can get this sort of fragmentation and extensive necrosis um, as the whole thing just sort of gets jumbled and the cells sort of knock into one another. Um, so some good trauma-induced changes, or nice representative at least, trauma-induced changes in the retina. And then the optic nerve is the last thing I'll show. Um, from low magnification, you may note that the uh, sort of brainwards end of the optic nerve here is looking a little bit pale staining, uh, a little bit more paler pink than the surrounding tissue. And we start in the more normal optic nerve. You can still see um, good cellularity over here um, and reasonably well-spaced uh, collagen uh, layers or beams of collagen. Um, but as we progress into this paler staining area, uh, it's basically just completely replaced by infiltrating gitter cells, um, which are these big foamy cells and are just the macrophages of the nervous system. Um, which uh, suggests a really extensive necrosis, uh, segmental necrosis of the optic nerve here, and the gitter cells have arrived to start to clean that up. Um, so potentially that could have uh, happened due to pressure from all this, the orbital swelling and hemorrhage on the nerve, um, maybe directly trauma, probably less likely, um, and uh, would have been uh, a potentially blinding issue if the cat wasn't already thoroughly blind from what's happened to the retina and the rest of the globe. Um, so uh, this is a, a case that's really well representative of several of the lesions we'll see in the eye with trauma. Um, also, uh, we typically can't really say exactly what causes trauma, although sometimes we have uh, situations that look more like blunt versus sharp trauma. So up here, we had that area um, that looked like it was more of a laceration or sharp form of ocular trauma. And then back here with the um, uh, hole in the posterior sclera suggesting a rupture, um, that's usually like something that we see more in blunt trauma. Um, so a combination of findings with sharp and blunt trauma often suggests a bite wound to us. Um, so basically you have the sharp trauma from the teeth and the blunt trauma from the pressure of the bite force uh, as the bite kind of clamps down. Um, so potentially this was a bite wound, although of course we can't be positive um, just based on our histologic evaluation. Um, so yeah, recession also is a good indication of blunt trauma. Yeah, cyclodialysis, blunt uh, trauma. I also wonder about like a projectile, like a pellet, mm -hmm. a pellet, a BB, yep. which they didn't mention clinically, but yeah. where we get the sharp lesion in the cornea and then the, yeah. the force of the thing flying through the eye. 
a BB could be a good option too. Actually, the representative gross photo that I showed uh, that looked similar to this eye was a BB or a gunshot trauma. Um, so yeah, bites or gunshots. Um, that's it for this case. Uh, we'll go to the diagnoses. Nope, that was the wrong button. It's impressive that fungus could, well, a sequester could form work. and fungus colonize it all in what, a day and a half or something? Three days. Yeah. Well, I guess. Okay. Anyway. Yeah, presumably the fungal colonization was opportunistic. The uh, ne necrotic cornea is a nice, warm, wet environment uh, for fungus to live. Um, Saprophytic fungi. Yeah. Um, so here's the list of diagnoses. I put a little asterisk next to the findings that are most consistent with trauma. Um, and uh, that's it. Um, any other questions? We'll do the next one. All right. Um, so this case is a nine-year-old neutered male domestic short-haired cat. Um, they say presented for a progressive cloudy and red eye. The eye was blephalmic with severe keratitis and corneal edema. The intraocular structures could not be seen. They say visualized, um, not be seen. Uh, OD was unremarkable. Um, so an interesting piece of history for this case, they say uh, his previously hit by a car um, and limps on a hind leg. Um, and that's about it for the general history uh, that was um, something that jumped out. Um, and so in this case, we have an eye with uh, lots of cloudy exit in the anterior chamber, a fairly thickened and cloudy cornea, probably consistent with their description of edema and or keratitis. Um, and this huge expansion of, in particular on this side, uh, the uvea and the sclera slash episcleral slash orbital tissue um, by the sort of white tan solid looking infiltrate. Um, there's more exudate in the other intraocular chambers, posterior, vitreous, subretinal. Uh, the retina is detached, and um, we have a lens in the middle of all of this. And you may have, given that I um, led with the history of hit by car, and now we have this eye that has lots of white tan tissue distorting structures, um, you may have a differential in mind, which was something that I was thinking of as I trimmed this globe originally. However, uh, do note that the lens, uh, while the edges are somewhat indistinct, uh, is actually fairly um, uninvolved with most of this white tan extension of the tissues. Um, it's not really surrounding the lens, it's sort of off to the side over here. Um, so that is significant history uh, for us. Um, and just to, just to clarify, Megan yeah. is referring to the post-traumatic ocular sarcoma. Oh, I was going to leave it as a... capsule rupture. That's fair. Okay. I was going to leave it as a mystery until more towards the end, but that's fine too. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, that's <laughs> um, So uh, yes. So the differential that uh, you may have been thinking of with a history of trauma in a cat followed by a progressively cloudy and increasingly enlarged eye with white tan tissue effacing some of the ocular structures could have been feline ocular post-traumatic sarcoma. Uh, not to worry. I, I mean, maybe it's better to be more specific rather than be cagey about it. But um, so, uh, um, however, uh, hold that thought, basically. Um, and uh, the fact that it's not sort of centered around the lens may be a clue that uh, it's sort of a bait and switch in this case. It's also not circumferential. It's also not circumferential, also a good point. Okay. So let's take a look at the eye, which is very cool. Let's get oriented here. See how it fits snugly into the stack? <laughs> indeed. <laughs> a little rectangular. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. It fit. Don't worry about it. And if it fits, it sits much like a cat. Uh, so, um, <laughs> Here's the cornea over here on the side of our slide uh, and the lens, which is again, looking relatively unconcerned uh, with all of this purple tissue that is uh, expanding, distorting uh, in particular one side of the eye. Um, you can see on the slow magnification view, the retinal attachment again too, which is nice. Um, so let's take a closer look at that abnormal tissue on the edge there. Okay, so now the cornea is at the top of the image again, just to reorient you. And uh, indeed, this purple tissue uh, is actually a little bit looking a little bit more heterogeneous with lots of areas of necrosis at lower magnification. And when we look at it closer, it is not neoplastic cells. It is inflammation. 
Okay, if we look even closer, I can confirm that for you. So we have a mixed population of cells, including macrophages and neutrophils primarily. Um, they will sometimes organize into discrete pyogranulomas. Um, and in particular, I'll direct our attention actually way back here to these huge swaths of necrosis. So you can see the edges of necrosis like here and here, um, where the inflammation meets these big areas of basically liquefactive necrosis um, in the choroid. And then in particular, if we look in these areas in the choroid, there are some really good examples of friends. Not very friendly friends, though. Frenemies, yes. Jamie says frenemies. Uh, so we have all of these lovely round structures uh, with a discrete cell wall and um, sort of heterogeneous basophilic contents. Um, and... I know for a fact that we have some really good examples of budding if we keep zooming along a little. Here we go. Over a little, there we go. Yeah. Nice examples of broad-based budding here um, in these yeast. And this is actually somewhat surprising for a cat uh, to have this many yeast organisms in an ocular infection of blastomycosis, which is the diagnosis. Um, for whatever reason, we tend to see a sort of low organism uh, infections in cats more commonly in the eye. This cat just happened to have a bazillion uh, yeast hanging around. Um, and indeed, this cat, you may be wondering where this cat lives. Uh, this cat comes from Illinois. Um, so. Can you see the optic nerve or any clinical uh, history of a central nervous system disease? Interesting. Uh, there was nothing in the optic nerve, but there is a little bit of inflammation extending into sort of the peripapillary connective tissue. Uh, nope, it, just the hind limb limp, hind leg limp from the previous hit by car trauma. But they say rest of physical exam of, on the day of surgery was unremarkable. Yeah, um, the only reason I mentioned that is because um, blastomycosis in cats, ocular blastomycosis in cats. Uh, appears to be correlated with also um, cerebral plasmacosis in cats. So, mm -hmm. um, and we don't know if that's a flat, you know, the, the organisms in the eye expanding to the brain or uh, the systemic infection going to both uh, locations at the same time, but there's a, appears to have a correlation with, with that. Yeah, that's actually an interesting question. Um, sometimes with cases like this, where there's like a sort of mass effect almost on one area of the eye, um, I sometimes wonder uh, whether there could be like a traumatic local inoculation of the organism causing the infection. However, um, we more commonly uh, assume that this is ocular manifestation of systemic disease, uh, more likely systemic mycosis. And indeed, in this case, you can actually see um, some of the organisms packed into blood vessels, which I think is... Wow kind of suggestive. Um, so uh, yeah, I presumably this is ocular manifestation of systemic disease. And yeah, hopefully they did the, a very careful check of uh, the rest of the animal. I'm sure they did. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, uh, so sound for the indeed, the, the condenser sound. Um, so yeah, uh, that's this case. I should show you guys the diagnoses. And there's definitely a way to start from this slide. There we go. And there it is. Uh, all right, that's it. That was good. All right. So next up, uh, we have the uh, globe from a 16-year-old male neutered chihuahua uh, that presented with uh, absent menace and dazzle, um, and they could not evalu evaluate the PLRs, had mild blepharospasm and mucus, um, severe conjunctival hyperemia, and corneal edema, uh, 360 degree um, peripheral uh, corneal vascularization, and they could not evaluate the intraocular structures. Um, the IOP was 50, and they said yes to glaucoma. Um, so they decided to enucleate the eye. Um, the, they noted that the other eye was not normal, and the other eye they uh, diagnosed as thesis bulbi. 
Um, so on our gross examination here, um, cornea at the top is cloudy, and you can see uh, this cloudy gel material in material in the anterior chamber um, and in the vitreous. And here is uh, what's left of our uh, lens. It's posteriorly luxated um, and kind of a little oddly shaped. Um, and you can maybe make out some um, white material kind of lining um, the anterior uh, iris um, and the retina is detached here. So, uh, switch over to the stone. All right. Um, so, looks fairly similar to our gross with the cordia over here and some uh, lovely pink material um, in the anterior chamber and vitreous. Our detached retina coming off here, our displaced lens, um, and then some infiltrate sort of lighting the back um, of the iris leaflets. Towards the front of the globe here. All right. Ooh. I'll get my focus a little bit. Um, so we do have um, vascularization and infiltration by neutrophils into peripheral cornea, as they were seeing uh, clinically. And that kind of uh, blends in with um, some uh, intense inflammation um, in the limbal area here, uh, mostly um, some macrophages and lymphocytes and plasma cells. Um, and we can see that's sort of kind of associated with the inflammation that is inside the eye as well. Um, so we have our iris leaflet here um, that has a nice uh, pre fibrovascular membrane, um, as well as this nice carpeting of these epithelioid macrophages and lymphocytes and plasma cells. Let's see. Closer. Just gonna do a quick look. Some of the macrophages contained phagocytized eosinophilic material, um, which could be red blood cells, um, but in this case was um, leaning towards uh, potentially phagocytized lens fibers from leaky lens protein. Um, from this lens uh, that does have some uh, severe cataractish change um, with liquefied lens fibers and some mineralization, some nice more gagne and globular uh, formation. Um, don't think we saw specifically a lens capsule rupture um, in this case, um, but uh, at least not in this section, um, but speculation that some of that was uh, lens protein um, within the macrophages. As we go back, um, here is our detached retina um, that is um, atrophied um, and necrotic in some areas. Got a, our loss of layering here and, and stuff going on as well. Um, so sort of that uh, lining by the um, uh, epithelioid looking macrophages um, on the uh, lens, or sorry, the iris uh, surface um, is uh, something that we see with um, asymmetric uveitis, um, which we believe is a kind of a hypersensitivity reaction to uh, lens fiber or uh, lens protein. Um, it usually does progress um, to uh, bilateral disease. Um, so we uh, kind of speculated in this case that potentially the other eye that already had thesis bulbi may have already been um, affected and maybe had this condition um, originally. And so now um, it was affecting uh, this eye as well. I'll just add that um, to the classic features of it, the, the macrophage carpet, the, usually there's a, an advanced cataract with leakage or exposure of lens fibers. And also very commonly we see kind of like in this case, there's necrosis of the peripheral retina. Mm -hmm.
Um, so, um, yes, all um, that's features of an asymmetric uveitis um, in this uh, chihuahua, which I think is also commonly seen in smaller breed dogs as well. All right, moving on for time. Um, okay, um, so next up, we have a um, almost five and a half year old uh, female spayed Australian shepherd dog. That's here. Um, so this is the uh, left globe um, that uh, was reported to be chronically uh, blind. Um, and they said that this dog has merle ocular dysgenesis. Um, which the Merle gene is responsible for the color dilution, um, making a lighter uh, coat color um, than the heterogeneous uh, genotype of the dogs. Um, it does not affect the eye color, which I thought was interesting. Um, so uh, they said that the uh, eye was small, so microphthalmia, and they first saw um, the, uh, the dog back in June of 2022 uh, for a complete hyphema. And um, it had persistent anterior uveitis that was managed with uh, DEX-SP and um, Ketorolac. Um, then it developed glaucoma at the RDVM um, this year, which was confirmed uh, in August uh, with an IOP of 45. Um, recently, did, uh, they found a mild rubiosis in corectropia. Uh, which is a displacement of the pupil from its normal central position um, and had a completely collapsed anterior chamber um, and they presumed a cataract with retinal detachment. Um, they say that the uh, other eye, the right eye, uh, was similar, uh, was small with uh, corectorpia and immature cataract, um, but that eye was visual. Um, also, um, going along with the more ocular dysgenesis kind of condition, uh, the patient was deaf. Um, which can be seen uh, with the Merle uh, conditions. Um, so here's our um, cut section um, of the eye, um, the cloudy cornea, and we can see that the interior chamber um, uh, is collapsed. Here's our, our lens is kind of surrounded, um, kind of brown at the periphery. Um, and you can see kind of this uh, yellow tissue um, kind of surrounding it 360 degrees. Uh, which we'll take a look at microscopically. Our retina is detached um, and the vitreous inside is uh, hemorrhage uh, gel. Um, and we noted that um, that's the subretinal space uh, was filled with brown liquid. Okay. Um, so, um, subgross, um, similar. Um, the lens is sort of um, a little bit anteriorly luxated here, um, surrounded um, by pink material that we'll take a closer look at, the hemorrhage um, and the vitreous with the detached retina and such. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at what's going on in here. Okay. So um, here's our lens, and it is actually uh, surrounded by fibrovascular membranes that are coming off of the iris, kind of coming off the ciliary body, um, and they kind of surround the lens kind of 360 degrees here. Um, there is cataract exchange um, into the, the lens with some liquefied lens fibers, mineralization, um, again, I don't think the lens capsule was ruptured, um, but we do have some hemorrhage and these nice acicular clefts that we saw in previous cases, um, indicative of cholesterol. Um, so some chronic hemorrhage going on. Um, there's hemosiderin, laden macrophages, and these kind of golden brown um, hematoidin. Um, so kind of chronic and ongoing uh, hemorrhage here. Um, and we were concerned that maybe some of this back here, um, there's some more, more of the fibrovascular membranes. Um, I'm gonna ignore my thought there. 
um, hemorrhage in the vitreous. Um, like I said, retina is detached. And with all the chronic hemorrhage, oh, let me go somewhere where there's not so many wrinkles so I can see it nicer. Um, so sometimes when we have a lot of chronic hemorrhage um, in the eye, um, it deposits in the blood vessels of the retina and it gets this kind of uh, blue purple uh, tinge uh, to the, the wall, which is iron deposition in the in the wall of blood vessels uh, known as ferrugination, which is Megan's favorite term. She's over here doing a little happy dance. Um, and then the other thing that we noticed with our um, detached uh, retina is kind of, kind of coming off the head of the optic nerve head um, is a small portion of some blood vessels and um, fibrovascular membranes, um, which um, could just be reactive change or um, potentially with all the stuff going around the lens uh, may represent um, persistent fetal vasculature, um, considering that the other changes for the moral ocular dysgenesis also represent congenital issues. Um, so that might be a part of that uh, disease process genetic process, I guess. Um, and, oh. and then one other thing that was a little, um, that caught us off guard and not really um, part of the process. Let's see if we can. Um, there was a choroiditis in this case. That was interesting and a little unexpected. Um, so it's kind of lymphoplasmacytic in some regions here. And then it was only in like one particular spot. Yeah. Interestingly, <coughs> I can't go any higher. Um, there were eosinophils associated with this inflammation, uh, which is something that we don't generally see uh, with run-of-the-mill uh, inflammation from like cataract or um, other stuff. Um, so that was kind of a, a weird, interesting finding. Um, we weren't really sure what to make of that, um, but I'll discuss it with our morphs here in a second. Um, so here... Um, so we um, had some findings consistent with moroocular dysgenesis that they had um, diagnosed clinically, um, the microophthalmia, uh, corectopia, cataract formation, retinal detachment. Um, it's not specific, obviously, for um, this condition because we can see that in a lot of other um, disease processes in the eye, um, but the patient was also deaf and Australian shepherds are a pretty uh, classic representation for the syndrome. Um, as I said, there was a lot of fibrovascular membrane formation. Um, some of it might represent persistent fetal vasculature, which would be another congenital thing. Um, and again, the eosinophilic and lymphoplasmacytic choroiditis, um, kind of an unknown etiology. Um, we did question if there was maybe a circulating eosinophilia um, in the patient for some reason, um, and that the presence of eosinophils might represent like a parasitic infection infections such as like a, a migrating um, larva, larva, larva migration, um, although we didn't see any uh, evidence of that in the sections that we had. Um, so, um, and then our chronic glaucoma secondary to our fibrovascular membranes and synechia for this case. So that was pretty cool. Um, it's not something I think that Coplau sees a lot of, um, even though it might be a common clinical yeah, we don't Same. get to see those neural ocular abnormalities that often. A lot of those eyes are relatively stable and we don't get them updated um, that frequently. All right. Okay. Cool. Thanks, That's everyone. All we have. Thanks for joining us.
I know I was. Uh, the dots and then oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. This one stop.